Hi everyone, it's Cristian Portilla. We're here in Jolt Radio. I'm here with Yahaira. Yahaira, wave. And Alex over there in the back. Um, You can now go to the main Facebook profile and share the live video. It might lag a few seconds, but um, I'm so excited to be with you all. Finally back in the studio. Took a little break, but now we're back. I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm super excited to be here with these two lovely ladies. And make sure if you want to hear the audio, go to joltradio.org. See you soon. All right, I'm gonna lower you guys real quick, and we're going live in just a couple of seconds. Okay, so three, two, and uh, one. Welcome to Meet Them Mondays on Joy Radio. I'm your host, Cristian Portilla, and today in the studio, I have Yahaira de la Espada and Alex Tertullian. Our show today is about biracial identities, or what we dubbed growing up mixed. Thank you, ladies, for being here today. Thank you for having us. So, originally, the show was inspired at a hangout one night. Um, Alex and I and Thad got on the race topic um that was on our last show be a man which you can listen to on runfreerates.com and alex had a different perspective on race and i thought it was a conversation that needed to extend past the four walls you know and so um yahaira is someone i've had the pleasure of like seeing in different circles i remember when we first met i was like yahaira right because run for right, so we bonded <laughs> over that. And, um, you know, we always seem to gravitate around the same circle, and we kind of kept commenting on each other's Facebook and Instagram, and I knew she was someone that I wanted to get to know deeper. So she's also a writer and a new friend. And so, ladies, um, first of all, I appreciate you both wanting to come on here and have this conversation with us today. Um, it's important for us to hear from, from this um, perspective of both of you because I feel like biracial identity in America had a, some shine with the royal wedding with Meghan Markle. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to learn about that. All of our listeners want to know about that. And I figured what better way than to have the stories of two women that live that every day. Mm. And so I wanted to get started and ask each of you how you identify. And Yahaira, maybe you can go first with that. Uh, thank you, Christian. I would say that I identify as Afro-Latinx, um, no hyphen. Um, and I think the hi- the hyphen is very important because we tend to delineate between this is what's African and this is what's Latin. And so I, I feel like my identity is not binary, it's, it's one. Um, so I say Afro-Latinx. Afro-Latinx. And for the people out there listening, what does the X and Latinx stand for? So the the X is something that I've I've been kind of researching a little bit more recently. The X to me stands for you know our all the way down to our language is <laughs> colonized a lot of times, and um, I feel like the the X stands for it's not man or woman; it's just human. Um, there's no you know o or a ah at the end of it. It's just it just X. Right, because in the in Spanish, we always like is gender we genderize like we say lat- Latina or Latino, and some people don't fall under those those um those yeah. labels. And what about you, Alex? How do you identify? Well, hello, thank you. <laughs> um, I identify as mixed. Um, my mom is white and my dad is black, and um, 
growing up, I used to call myself a mocha baby. So <laughs> I mean, you will that. hear me say that a lot. Um, um, yeah, mixed. Okay. Mixed race. Awesome. Okay, thank you. And I guess, was your family vocal about teaching you about both of your races? I want to kind of really start at the beginning of this. Um, or was this research that you had to do on your own? Maybe Alex? Yeah. Um, so growing up, I mean, I mean, I knew my mom was white and my dad was black and it was normal to me. We never really had a sit down and was like, hey, these things are going to come up. People might ask you questions. It just was. Okay. So I feel like I know what I know or I've just been through certain things, my own experiences and maybe researched or looked into things a little bit more or especially growing up, like questioned myself a lot. So I don't want to say that it was like topic of conversation. Like my mom sees me as her child and my dad as his. It was never a matter of race or even with family. It was never mm -hmm. something that we spoke about. Right. It just was, you know, I obviously did. my mom had like a crazy story with my dad. Mm -hmm. But other than that, me personally with my brother, it was what it was. Okay. And are there other interracial couples in your family, or was your mom one of the very first? My mom was it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, she was it. So it was a really, really big deal back in the day. And what sure. ethnicity are your parents? So my mom is Greek, and my dad is Haitian. So growing up, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen my big fat big wedding. Greeks are supposed <laughs> to marry Greeks and breed more Greeks. Yeah. And so she was the black sheep of the family. So mm -hmm. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And Yahaira, for you being Afro-Latina, was that a journey of like self-discovery or did you always identify with your Afro or your African-American side or your Latino side? Was there like a side that was more dominant? Yeah, I think um, my experience was a little bit different in the sense, well, not really different, but um, my father just immigrated to, to the United States and met my mom, then they got married. And then they moved to a small military town where they had absolutely no family. And although the town was very diverse, they were in the process of doing a lot of assimilating. So for them, they they did what they could to assimilate me and, and they thought that that was a good thing. So for example, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish in the house. Oh wow. My parents, yeah, they would speak to each other <laughs> but they wouldn't, they wouldn't speak Spanish to us, which I thought was really, really weird. So all of the Spanish I know is that I taught myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then when my grandmother would come, or, you know, the grandmothers from the different, you know, sides, they would come and they wouldn't speak English at all. You know, for their generation, it's like, we're not going to speak English. Like, we're going to speak Spanish, even though they're both colonized languages. Um, they felt more pride in speaking Spanish with me. So growing up... It, I knew that I was, you know, my, my mother's from Puerto Rico, my dad's from Panama. I knew that I, that they were there, you know, that they came from the island that, you know, my father had recently immigrated, but I didn't know of myself to be a, a Latina child. Okay. It, so it what just, did you think or how did you identify then? Like, what did yeah, you think Yeah, I were? just, I mean... I think as a kid, you know, you just kind of say I'm human, whatever. Um, <laughs> like most of us. <laughs> like most of, yeah, you know, you try to, you know, point out the aliens and whatnot. But um, I, I think for me, I knew I knew I was Spanish because I heard them speaking Spanish. We would like, you know, she would play, you know, salsa when it's like time clean on Saturday morning, like <laughs> all of that, you know, but... I felt like I was I was both I was both enough but there were some times in my life where especially growing up that it was you don't call yourself black you call yourself Latina Wow yeah and why was that and where, where did that message come from mostly my mom um, okay. my father was gone a lot because he, he would get deployed to different um, places but um, my mother she would say you tell people that you're Puerto Rican and you're Panamanian and I thought growing up that that was such a like mouthful to say, you know, right. like it's too much. <laughs> I just want to, you know, not say anything. <laughs> um, but for her, it was always like you you don't tell people that you're black. But then that changed after a while. I think even recently for my family, um, everyone's kind of awakening and you know in their own 
in their own journeys and and so i think that they're kind of understanding that that was maybe not the best thing to say to a kid right okay absolutely and um from hearing this it seems like you were starting to get comfortable with both of or maybe you were always comfortable with both of these races or or um ethnicities i should say but um and also being black being afro latina you know did you have a point where you where you started feeling comfortable because i think the wave has been of of education and acceptance i've seen it a lot with the natural hair movement i've seen it now with a lot of more people claiming they're afro latina or, or claiming <laughs> yeah alex is shaking her curtain here yeah but um which is gorgeous by the yes, way i was girl. admiring it in all the pictures i was like her hair is so cute it is and yours is fabulous as well thank you and she washed it yesterday was washed it so you sundays is washed day so we have our process so yeah. you know mondays is a good look for oh me. so this is a fresh twist yeah. okay <laughs> see you, just a, a wash and go you know type <laughs> ordeal but for all the curlies out there <laughs> i love that um did you uh, or maybe alex did you at one point start getting more comfortable with being two races like or or how was that like accepting that? um so one thing definitely stuck out to me um when i was younger my brother and i went to private school so we were um i would say in a predominantly white school okay. um so my race really stuck out to me because i remember at the time uh, spice girls was really popular and by mm-hmm. default everyone was like you're scary spice <laughs> And I was like, but why are there so many baby and posh spice? And like, yeah. I don't remember the other spices. But I was like, <laughs> why am I thrown into this scary spice category? And granted, she was beautiful. But I was like, okay, well, damn. Like, now I know that, like, I'm different from right. these other girls. That's how they see me. Right, exactly. So then probably, like, a year after that, we went to a public school and a predominantly black and Hispanic school. Okay. So where in private school, nobody really asked me about my race. It was just, like... This is Alex, and she is... Scary Spice. Scary Spice. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I went to public school, it was the first time where people were actually like, what are you? Because mm. I, I get that I'm Dominican a lot of times, which, thank you, love Dominicans, y'all are beautiful <laughs> people. But I was like, no, I'm Greek and Haitian. And then I would get those comments where, which really upsets me, and it's like, damn, you're a pretty Haitian. And mm. I was like, what does that mean? Because I have beautiful Haitian family members, you know? And it's just like... I don't know what these stereotypes are that people have in their heads about what Haitians might look like, but I mean, there's Haitians of all different skin tones, colors, I mean, curly hair, straight hair. Like I didn't see what the, it didn't make sense to me. So that was really the first time that I was like, okay, this is a thing and you need to embrace it for what it is. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not Dominican. So it was just like, obviously we live in Miami. Everyone's like, you're Hispanic by default. (laughs) And, um, I was just like, no, like, I'm this. And it was the first time that I really came into my Greek haitian so to speak, you know? And it was was an interesting time. Because as a kid, you just want to, like, fit in somewhere. And I realized that this is my own little niche, my own little nook, you know, that I sat in. And that it was other people pointing out your differences, right? Yeah. And hiding that for you. Yeah, because maybe maybe I was the first Greek haitian that they had ever met, Mm -hmm. you know? And it was, or people were like, what is, what is Greek? And I was like, Greek is the language that they speak in Greece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was just, you know, like, you know, I guess, uh, you know, teaching people, informing them of something that, you know, they didn't really know of just because, again, I was in a predominantly Hispanic and black school at right. the time. And it was just, a, it was an interesting time. Yeah. Mm. For sure. You're listening to Meet Them Mondays on Joe Radio. I'm your host, Cristian Portilla. I'm here with Yahaira de la Espada and Alex Rutulian. And we're talking about growing up of biracial identity in, in America. And so, um, Yahaira, when you were teaching yourself and when you were learning the, the language of your elders, um, did you ever have that or did did you ever have that time where people would say like, Oh, you're Latina but you don't speak Spanish? Yeah, a lot. Uh, even still, kind of, because I, I consider myself that I speak Spanglish. Okay. Um, which I believe the Puerto Ricans invented. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I think that when I was coming up, just to backtrack a little bit, the, the, the city that I grew up in, the small military town, although it was a small country town in Texas, the military brought so much diversity 
So I grew up with Samoans, Filipinos, Germans, um, a bunch of Nigerian people, like just a, a bunch of everything. Um, and so coming up, you just knew that everyone was different. Mm -hmm. And also in my, in my town, in my hometown, there was a Panamanian Independence Festival every November. Wow. Um, and like, like all these other, I mean, I didn't pay attention to the other countries, obviously, because whatever, but, um, you know, it was, it was a big thing that people were embracing their culture. People were embracing their culture. And, and there was every, you know, group of people had their social club, if you will. And every group of people had their independence festival. If, you know, if they had one, if they, if they celebrated it. So, so coming up, it was, it was kind of, you had to, you had to embrace those differences. And then when the elders would see you, as you said, and they saw that you didn't speak Spanish, it was, why don't you speak Spanish? Um, and then, you know, sometimes my parents were there to say, well, you know, we're trying to teach our kids English. And, and they never really gave a good reason as to that. Um, but I think it, it became more of a thing when I got to college. Uh, I moved to San Antonio, Texas, which is about three hours uh, south of my hometown. And in San Antonio, it's you got the black side of town, the Mexican side of town, and the white side of town, and there's nothing else. You know, maybe some Asians sprinkled in here and there, but... So was it important for you to claim, like, your identity and say what you were? Yeah, yeah. So in college is where I really started flourishing in the this is this is what how i want to be identified i was taking lots of african-american literature classes and um african-american history in san antonio and so that kind of opened me up because the the professor to that uh class he was um, a chicano but he he called himself afro-mexican and so, you know, and then he he would teach it all the way back to like before Santa Ana and he was like Santa Ana was a black man and I'm like, "What? Like <laughs> you didn't say that growing up, you know? Like he was like Santa Ana had a afro, you know? Like the 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 Mexican independence was really fighting white Tennessee settlers that were coming in trying to bring slavery and Mexico was like, mm, -mm we're not doing that." Why? And so even I mean there's even like a piece of of Mexican culture and history that I that I grasp onto even though I'm not Mexican um but growing because up in you Texas learned, you you went back to your roots through that yeah and let me ask you this Alex do you because you are black and white I remember when we were talking about this mm -hmm. when we initially started talking um about feeling authentic to your mm -hmm. race or to your ethnicity and um you told me that there's times where you either hold back from doing things associated with a culture or um or or maybe feeling like an imposter and like not being black enough for black people or maybe being like too white white or, right and i remember you use the term white passing which i wanted you to explain that to us right and, so and that feeling i um definitely growing up it's like i mean again there's whites i have a white fam like white side of my family black side of my family and um Growing up, it was just like, not necessarily in a family setting, but just out and about, whether it be in school or I guess school is it, because what else were we doing as, like, as children? Um, but yeah, I mean, if I hung out with white kids, I wasn't white enough. And if I hung out with black kids, I was never black enough. So it's like, you're kind of like, as a child trying to fit in, you're trying to find your own little space and like, mm -hmm. nobody really wants to claim you. So it's an interesting mm -hmm. space to be in, you know? And that's why, um, I mean, now that I think about it, it's thank God for my, you know, Hispanic friends because they sat somewhere in the middle and they were like, yeah, girl, we got you. Like, we'll take you in type thing, you know? I love that. Um, but it, with regards to the white passing thing, it's actually come up a lot. And the whole Meghan Markle thing, really, um, I've explained to people, like, my mom was super excited and obviously working in news, it was like everywhere. And I was just like, I'm a little over it. Like, she's a princess. I'm happy for her. And he is a prince. But like... Why do we care so much? Like, they're super far away. Um, and I get the, um, from a political, social, you know, aspect, like, she is a mixed-race woman, you know? And I was like, I am Meghan Markle, so to speak, but I literally could not stop thinking the entire time. And I was like, what if she wore her hair natural? What mm -hmm. if her skin tone was, like, slightly darker? Or, you know, she had more African-American features? Would we be making such a bit would she even be where she is 
Mm. you know mm-hmm. and it's like you get a lot of times and you know I was speaking about it with some you know friends and family members um, on my black side and it's like well she's white passing and I've gotten that a lot as well where black people say that you're white passing like you pass as white okay. and I'm like which is interesting because I don't think any white man would look at me and be like you're white right not with this hair <laughs> you know and not that I'm super dark like I think I'm relatively fair but my features are from my Haitian side. I don't look Greek, you know what I mean? And it's mm-hmm. like, you kind of, you always get that in a lot of conversation. It's like, oh, well, you, you pass as white, so you're fine. So this doesn't, you know, include you or affect or you, you in any way. You. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, again, it puts you in, till this day in a weird space because, you know, I love my black people and my white people and everything in between, you know? It's not a matter of white passing, black passing. It's, <laughs> it's and, um, weird to me. What can you speak to on privilege? and how maybe some people come to you and saying you have the privilege of a white person and you have the privilege because i've also read that there's black privilege right and have you had those instances where people come at you talking to you about your privilege and you kind of have to like check them or educate them about your experiences um i don't want to say i have too many but one in particular stuck out to me when the whole black lives matter thing was big and in the news and stuff and um It was a conversation I had with a girl who was African-American and um, we were having a conversation. I was just like, obviously, I'm for Black Lives Matter, you know, and she kind of was like, well, it doesn't really apply to you. And I was a little taken back because I was like, excuse me. Right. (laughs) I was like, again, if a white man saw me or, you know, let's say in a Trayvon Martin type situation or I mean, anything that's going on in this world today if a white man stopped me or saw me is he gonna think that i'm white no he's gonna be like you're black Mm -hmm. so she was just like why are you going so hard for like black lives matter and i'm like it made me think not only do black lives matter and i I mean this is like a whole nother you know topic um but it's just like so then i was like okay so black lives matter and in my case white lives matter because i have white family and i have black family and i was like so then is it, you know, do all lives matter? Because where do I fit in? Where do you fit in as a Hispanic? Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, we're, you know, why are we, it, it kind of upsets me that we're all trying to, like, find our place and fit into this little box when we don't maybe necessarily fit in one box or the other. Yeah. In my case, you mm-hmm. know, or even in yours, you know, it's like, it's an unfair space to be in. And she was just, like, going on and on. And I was just like, I mean, to me, it was ignorance. Yeah. But... I mean, it is what it is. We're all entitled to our own opinions, and yeah. And Yahida, before I come to you, because I I wanted to specifically ask you about colorism, Mm -hmm. and I remember that was something important. Alex, really quick, before we finish this chain of thought, I I remember reading and, and discussing about some of the things that we see online, and how now people are very quick to um to express their emotions and and do the whole white people this or the white women that or or the white man does this right mm-hmm. and we and it's we, the 70s all over again mm-hmm. and we <laughs> welcome and we, yeah and we welcome. call out people like oh you know because that white woman did this or whatever um how does that make you feel when you're half black half white and according to everyone in the world on the internet everywhere else you know white people have always been the oppressors yes historically as well okay yeah. But I mean, in terms of feeling wise and having a white woman as a mother and having that race oppress, let's say, your your black race. Right. And dealing with things that you read or saying like that white woman this or that or, you know, like, how do you how do you have that internal conversation with yourself where you realize mm-hmm. like, dang, this person could be talking about my mom. Right. Or, <laughs> or, or this black man could have been my dad. Right. Or mm-hmm. anyone in my family. Yeah. Um, it's a little difficult, and I think it's um, it's important to, again, I sit back and I question myself a lot, and, you know, obviously working in the TV industry, news, um, I see a lot of this all day. And, um, yes, it does get a little difficult at times, but I think it's just, you know, I, I try to be very positive and I, you know, I, I I love my mom and her side of the family and I love my dad and their side of the family and, you know, I pray to God that, you know, nothing were to ever happen to either one of those um, sides. 
Um, but again, you kind of fall into this middle ground and you kind of, not that I feel like I don't have a voice, but that, that middle ground isn't really talked about a lot. Like you said, where, where are the kids or the people that have a white mom, a black dad, or that's why we're here. Right. Or even like, you know, again, to Hispanics, where do y'all fall? (laughs) Like where, where's, you know, where's your voice in all Mm -hmm. of this? And it's just like, I feel like you don't see that a lot. So it's a struggle. Um, but I guess something that we just deal with and it's a like case by case type situation and yeah. you're listening to meet them mondays on jolt radio this is the biracial episode and yeah Haida, um did you want to add to that and and i also definitely wanted to bring up colorism because mm-hmm. i know you wanted to talk about that i'm kind of curious to first of all can you tell us what colorism is and then um how do you see that unfolding for afro latinas Afro-Latinos, Afro-Latinx mm-hmm. um, people. So I'd say in, in my context, colorism means uh, a, a caste system. Um, we have, you know, Mestiza, Mulata, um, Trigenia, you know, all of these different um, terms terms that, that the Spanish used when they first came to our, our countries. Um, and and it's 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 interesting because a lot of what you said resonated with me in the sense of both of my parents are my complexion um my grandparents some of them are a lot darker and some of them are your complexion some of them look white uh and and you know growing up <laughs> trying to unpack all of that is is strange because you then i talked to my 99 year old great grandmother who's still alive today oh wow i saw her three two three months ago um she lives in spanish harlem and she's giving me her slave narrative oh wow of being 15 having two children being taken to new orleans to take care of the woman of the house wow and that and that that person is still alive so i've been (laughs) really like doing my research getting ready for this conversation because i'm like i have so much to say yeah please she's she's still alive you know um and we're talking about kanye you know (laughs) like we're talking about the royal wedding like i don't care right yeah a woman that was in slavery is still alive today and i can touch her skin and her face and she can hug me and that means a lot to me this woman every every time i talked to my my great grandmother i bought her a little you know the old lady they wear the little Panuelo. you know panuelos and stuff and so i bought her one and she says to me she says i can't wear that porque parece un monio i look like, i'll look like a monkey and everything that she does she'll say i don't want to do that because i'll look like a monkey oh my god wow. and me muero. Like I don't. She's internalized. She's yeah. internalized that for her entire life. life. Yeah. And it's 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 hard because it's like I know that her mother died in childbirth. Her mother that was the same complexion as her. Her tia, which was a a white passing Latin person, took care of her, and she became the slave of the house for her tia. And do you think that all these stories or also having your family so close to you kind of changes your perspective when you do have these race debates or when you do see these topics in the media? Because obviously, every you know, colorism, like you say, and, and how I've read from, from posts and things like that, um, is is the media or, or the people that have the ability to make certain people have status and stuff pick people that are that are have more european features as opposed to giving people someone that they can identify with um when they're speaking about a certain race so Mm -hmm. if we're talking about an afro-latina then we don't only want to see the afro-latina that has the straight hair and whatever other features right Mm -hmm. um we want to see the afro-latina with textured hair or amarela negra or something like that Mm -hmm. and that's where colorism is one of those things where it's like can we all be represented here you know please yeah (laughs) and i mean we're having 
the same conversation, but we're also having very t two separate conversations because you look at race relations in America look a lot different than race relations in Latino mm -hmm. America, you know, because you, you still have um, news, news uh, stations that will outright say, we will not take a person that doesn't look like J-Lo. Like, they still say that in certain places. I mean, I mean, even here, the other, a few months ago, like the, the, the play that had the cute in Little Havana, they had the black face on. That's still a thing that is very common yeah. in Latin culture. And then you, and then you try to talk about the, the colorism or, or this, or not even colorism, but the socio-political um, nature of Black Lives Matter. Um, which is something I did want to I did want to speak to because as someone that did grow up over here and not um, in Latin America, I resonate with Black Lives Matter in the sense of the first people that were enslaved on this land were the First Nations and African people that are also my descendants, but Af then, then they turned to African Americans. So I think for anybody that is coming to this country, I think it's it's good to, as a, a good measure to say, if the First Nation people and the African American people don't have their freedom, then nobody else is gonna have their freedom who, who comes here. You know, um, that's different if I'm coming to Panama, if I'm going to, to Puerto Rico, which is a whole nother story right now. <laughs> Yeah. Um we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break. Yeah. And as soon as we come back, we can definitely finish off that topic, okay? You're listening to Meet Them Wendy's on Jolt Radio. That was Georgia Smith, Lifeboats. You're listening to Meet Them on Days on Jolt Radio. I'm your host, Cristian Portilla, and this is the biracial episode. And Yahaira, you were just um, tying in or finishing up about colorism and, and speaking to that for um, Afro-Latinos mm -hmm. culture. And so you were saying that basically our people need to make more progress into accepting more Afro-Latinas and, and putting out um, in the mainstream media more Afro-Latinas of different shades and darker shades. 
Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I'd say that throughout a lot of the media that I see, not just in Panama, but in other places, the people that are lighter with, with straighter hair, more European features, are usually the ones telling the news, telling the weather, telling everything. Uh, and I mean, Sabado Gigante, I feel like, was the darkest person I ever saw growing up on, mm -hmm. on Spanish, um, excuse me, Don Francisco, on you know, Spanish media. And he wasn't even, you know, that dark. You no. know, he definitely, I think he relaxed his hair, but, you know. Didn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Now that we're talking about that, um, and, like, changing the features and things like that, um, I'm, I really want to ask both of you about the black card, right? And, um, and if you've ever had your black card revoked or someone say, like, you're not black enough to do that or to say that or to whatever it was um i've had i've seen instances where people have been like I, it's a hypothetical thing right like the black card right you're like not black enough but um you're not black enough to speak certain slang or to say certain words or to do certain things have you guys ever had that situation with that phenomenon of like having your black card revoked or having anything of that come up when i was reading about these topics i was like wait like that's a thing that's a thing in black code <laughs> Listen, forgive my ignorance, but it's true. Like, yeah, you know, what what can you both say to that about? I'm gonna no, don't point at me. Come on, you got okay. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I no, I have not experienced that. Mm -hmm. Only because I grew up in the country. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I like I love riding horses and yes, girl. You know, that's not a white thing to me. That's a country thing. <laughs> and um, I, yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I've felt that. But I have felt like I've had to code switch. What which, do you mean by that? Which is like, you know, having to speak to people differently um, based upon who I'm talking to. Wow. And not to say that they're n not my voices. Like, they all are. But it's, I, it's definitely a a choice on which one that I'm choosing to speak in. I could feel you on that one. For yeah. sure. Yeah? What yeah. do you think about that? I um I feel like uh well I've always been um so when I went to this, you know, middle school, predominantly Hispanic, black, it was like you talk white and I was like <laughs> what this is my voice. Like what do you mean? Um and it's funny because I feel like amongst friends or like I'd say my black or Hispanic friends, I'm a lot more relaxed. And obviously my mom, she knows, she, she, forget it. She knows it all or whatever. But I feel like when you're in certain situations, you kind of like tone it down a mm -hmm. little bit, I'd say. Yeah. You know, or, you know, like when we, you know, we were speaking with Mel's, your lovely wife, yeah. and she was saying how like in her head, she's like, I'm going to a job interview. I need to straighten my hair. Oh my god, yeah. And <laughs> you know, you grew up and I was like literally in pain. You have scabs on your scalp, okay? Because That's your hair when the relaxer worked. When you had the scab. You were literally like holding on to something because <laughs> you could no longer take the pain. And it's just like you're doing this because in your mind or society told you that so your it's... curly hair is not a good look. That's mm -hmm. not good hair. You Which know? is a physical form of, of code switching, I feel like. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you're literally like, oh, no, I'm going to do this, like, professional thing. So, and again, who in society said that straight hair is professional? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Doesn't make, I want to work like this this morning. Yeah. Um, but it was a, it's, in, in instances like that, I feel like I felt it a little bit more. Not necessarily that my black card was taken away from me or not. I guess I've been too white for a lot of things. And, Yeah. It's just an interesting... The that hair is, thing really stuck out to that's me. That's so funny how, how people can say things like that, like riding horses, and that's a white thing to do, or whatever might be a black thing to do. Um, and speaking to maybe what I've experienced, right? We were talking about this earlier. Um, well, for me, obviously, I'm Latina. Full Latina. I'm Colombian. But um, if I'm in Colombia, I'm a gringa. <laughs> <laughs> But if I'm here, I'm Latina AF. And I, I love that. You know, I love yeah. that side of myself. Yeah. But, um, and then, of course, I grew up here in Miami, born and raised. 
and I mostly had black or Latino friends. I only had one or two white friends. So there was, I guess, a little bit of code switching when I am around like my white boss or my or like that one or two white people or you white like girl. You speak differently white. or like you conduct yourself almost different. Like you know what almost I mean. like on a not so relaxed level. <laughs> well, they always bring up to me my accent. Mm. That's like the one thing. You know what I mean? And, and, then, and that's what my, that's why my, I think that's why my dad didn't want us speaking Spanish because his accent is heavy, heavy. still. Whoa. And like, you know, coming up in the military, that's how he learned English. Okay. And so for him, I feel like it's a lot of like, you know, trauma that, that had to happen for, you know, whatever drill sergeant he had at the time to like make him speak in English. But I've, oh, I've been fascinated by that too. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do with your accent? I can't hide it, girl. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? It's like the thing that people enjoy. One of the things people love the most it's about you. Me. 100%. Like, I love listening to meet them on these because that voice, girl, you're from Miami. Yes. Like, hey, I can't hide that. Yeah. You know? And so we're, we're talking about um, the relationship that you guys have had with your family or getting hair done and things like that. Um, was there some education that you had to do and teaching maybe your parents or your mom or something um, about self-acceptance or about accepting natural hair or um, maybe saying like this shade of like don't go out into the sun because you might get more dark and you're like I'm okay with being this color I'm, I'm okay with wearing this nail polish that makes me look a little bit more dark or whatever that might be especially because I feel like we are very lucky to also be living in these times where there's a lot of awareness going on yeah. Um, I find that we also have to educate our family members. Mm -hmm. I've had to educate some of mine. Have you had that where you have to educate some of them about acceptance and things like that? Um, so funny, since we're on the hair topic, my mom is a hairdresser. Yeah. And she is the white one. So growing up, the hair thing was such an issue. You know, like on the bottle of hair products, it's like only use a quarter size. And I'm like, mom, I gotta use the whole bottle if this is gonna do anything to my hair. This is two servings in yeah. this bottle. I was That's like, it. This is not gonna work. So um, the hair thing, especially with my mom, I think maybe at like the age of 13, 14, we finally were like, listen, this is your hair. We gotta figure out a way for it to work and like stop fighting it, you know, mm -hmm. because. She would literally sit there and like blow dry my hair for an hour and a half, once a week, and then I'd go outside in this beautiful humidity and look like the Lion King all <laughs> over again. And it was just like, the struggle was so real <laughs> growing up with the hair thing. So um, especially with my mom, and she's always been like, oh my God, if I had your hair, I'd wear it out and this, that, and the other. And growing up, I'm like, no, I want to like tame it, whatever. And now I just don't care. Like it is what it is, you know? Yeah. You obviously, you grow up, you grow into your own, and you know, I love my hair now. It's yeah. uh, I hate it on wash days, but I do love it. Um, but from aside from the hair thing, I feel like I have just really, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say that I've had to like educate my mom. She's kind of, I'm always very like open and honest with her. It just, I am myself around her all the time. So she knows, you know, what I listen to, my thoughts on certain, you know, certain things, you know, she's not like one of those parents that are like, I hate this music or, you know, cause you get, you, I used to get that too. Like for my dad, like, what is this garbage that you're listening to coming from the black one? I'm like, Mom, dad, this is like cool music. Like, what do you, you know, as a kid. Yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, I, yeah, I don't really feel like I have to educate her as much, but I think certain things come up and, you know, like the Meghan Markle thing, I was like, can we stop talking about her? Like, I'm, I'm over it, you know? Yeah. And it's, again, just because I was going through this internal yeah. struggle myself and I was like, you're not going to get it. So there's certain times that I do just kind of like internalize and hold back because I can't expect her to understand everything that I'm going through either. Right. You know, so yeah. it's, it's that. That's why you have friends. Mm -hmm. and you know and we have these conversations in exactly. kitchens over yeah. pizza right and yeah, I yeah. you know speaking um speaking of that um did you did you ever in terms of your afro latina and um how you identify um did you have to you know do some healing with your family or, or educate them like how was that experience like for you if you want to be open about that yeah i mean where do you start kind of thing um part two girl part two. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so when I first went natural um it was so cheesy but I had I was 
It was cheesy in the sense that I was taking an Af- African American studies course, and it was like my topic, my topic course study. And in the class, I chose the obviously the new documentary by Chris Rock, Hair. That was like my whole paper was about hair, and I was I was relaxed at the time, and I was like, okay, let me see what this like, let me see what this guy's talking about, because I I've never heard of like relaxers causing cancer and I was like just getting into like healthy living and all of that so I was like I'm gonna see what this is about so I I (laughs) look through the whole documentary I read a few books and I'm just like oh my gosh I've been getting a relaxer since (laughs) I was four years old I'm gonna die from (laughs) relaxer I have a brain like (laughs) space in there like it's a hole somewhere um I'm just freaking out and then I was like, okay, so I literally have to stop relaxing my hair. And my mom, oh my God, like she was so livid. She was livid. She was like, your hair is so beautiful. Why would you like do that to your hair? Like you look like, I mean, she, she would say some really mean things. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it on yeah. the radio show, but there's, we're having the same conversation, but we're having different conversations because in Latin culture, Mejorando la raza is a real thing yeah. to this day. Making, you know, making the, the yeah, making the race the better. better. Or whatever. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it's like, okay, well, your curly hair is an pelo assault. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a pelo mal. Like, it, it's an assault to whatever form of Spanish people are holding on to. Yeah. It, it seems kind of strange. You know what? I... I want to say something about that. And so my wife is Dominican. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey, baby. And um, she has very beautiful natural hair, right? And um, I'm noticing now that her mom, mind you, my wife has been wearing her hair natural, I believe, um, since high school. Like, she she had been relaxing, and then she, like, let that go. Um, so she's been on her natural thing for years now. But... Um, they're Dominican, and and I oh, I noticed this as well in DR while we were there, right? But um, for our Latino brothers and sisters of other countries, and especially Afro Latinos, um, they have this thing where it's like pelo malo, or your nose is like this. It's not pinched enough, or your lips are this and whatever. You right? Put the and, clothespin. Yeah, my um, grandmother told me to do that. My great grandmother, by yes. the way. Yes. And, and I was and, like, what's wrong with my nose? <laughs> God, and it really, <laughs> let me tell you something. My suegra, my, my mother-in-law came over to the house yesterday. And I, I always saw her like, Tú eres mi negra bella. Yo te amo. You're beautiful. I love your hair. I love your co-. Like, you know, I love her so much. <laughs> but anyway, she was wearing her hair natural, mm-hmm. right? And I've noticed now as the years have been going by that we've been in this family, how she would always get her hair de rizao. She was always getting it blow-dried. And then there was this change, and this change mm. as the years have been coming by. And now, just yesterday, she was like, I, I'm not even straightening my hair anymore. I'm not even getting it blow dried. And um, she said something, and it was something like of, of, of pelo malo, of someone saying something to her about wearing her hair curly. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, your hair is beautiful. I love your hair like that. You know, and I always, we always try to, like, change that narrative because this is a Dominican woman who her whole life, you know, even even her partners or whoever, because men do that too to us, um, to where women say, like, de risa del pelo or, or strain your hair. Mm-hmm. And then you want to feel like you want to look beautiful to your partner. So you do these things. And I'm talking about old mentalities, right? But they trickle down and now... I see my suegra. She's and rocking, she's the curls. rocking those yeah. curls, yes. and her texture is so beautiful. And she take, you know, she's she's very like proud of that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I can only ask myself, and also be thankful that we're in these times where she's also seeing and feeling that change. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's such a beautiful thing because she's already older, mm-hmm. but that mentality of feeling beautiful in your own skin shines through. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, and that's. That's beautiful, and it gives me hope because I've been trying to get my my mother to re- not stop relaxing her hair, mm-hmm. and it just hasn't. I mean, she's relaxed her hair since she was young, and now she's you know forty something. Like, yeah. and all my mother wants is a fro. <laughs> right, we always want what we can have. 
<laughs> and have you have either one of you traveled back to um to your parents' countries and and felt what that was like in your own identity? Like what are, how did people perceive you and you know, mm. who wants to who wants to go first? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> uh yeah, so I I've been to Panama uh, lots of different times and it's it's in some ways it's a lot worse and in some ways it's a lot better in the sense of you know I can go to Panama and I feel a pride with everyone um, the the Kuna Indians the the Chocoy the um, the people in Chiriqui like everyone is just Panamanian and although there's definitely that underlying racism still and and, and in some ways still blatantly on the on the neighborhood or the community level I don't feel there's so much of a difference um, last year was the first time that I actually was able to go to Puerto Rico mm-hmm. for the first time ever because we only went we only did family vacations where family lived <laughs> which is yeah anyway we never like went anywhere else so or you got a place to stay where the family lived. exactly so that's all we were doing just New York and Panama New York and Panama um, so you went to Puerto Rico. So I went to Puerto Rico. None of the, none of my Puerto Rican family lives in Puerto Rico. They all uh, left left when again Puerto Rico is a whole other part too. So I'm not gonna get into it. But they left. So I went to Puerto Rico and it was weird. Number one, because I didn't see a lot of young people. Uh, but the people that I did see, I felt like it was there was not really, and I wasn't there long. So I'll, I'll preface my statement to say that, but. Um, I didn't feel like there was a pride about being in Puerto Rico and being Puerto Rican mm. that I've always felt when I've gone to Panama. Um, and then, I mean, my tias are just like, my tias, like, you know, one is just like very strict and like you have to wear your hair straight and like you have to look like this is a professional <laughs> job at the museum, you know, whatever with the Smithsonian. And then this other tia is like, you know, do whatever you want, you know. So, you know, those dynamics kind of, you know, reign true. But. And Alex, for you, going um, back to Greece, how so was that like? So, Greece, um, my brother and I used to go every summer, and that was interesting because um, typically Greeks are not black, or they're not black Greeks. Um, and I want to say that, I mean, granted, we were kids, um, but there was definitely, you could feel the racism while we were there. And I remember one particular time, because um, I do actually speak Greek, um, hey. Yeah, <laughs> um, my brother and I were at the beach, or like in the water per se, and these two ladies were talking about the two little black kids in the water, and I turned around to her, and I was like, "Well, we're Greek," and she had nothing to say. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, and I was like, I was young, so I was like, "Yes, Alex, <laughs> do your thing." Um, so yeah, I mean, I always felt it there, and we would spend all summer there. I mean, we're out in the sun every day beautiful tan so I was like yes and then you have this lady that's like these black kids you know just being super negative about it and um and again that's me as a child I mean who knows what my you know my grandmother went through or you know like I didn't meet my grandfather till I was like six or seven because he wanted nothing to do with us my great grandfather Mm -hmm. you know and again it's you know it's It's he has certain traumas that he went through and I mean a whole nother show um but it's just like you definitely felt it while you were there, but you know, I was there to spend time with my grandparents and like we made the absolute best of it. And again, it's like there aren't black Greek people, so we were like these foreign exotic things to them. She probably mm. could have went about saying what she said in a nicer way. Yeah. Um, but she didn't. Um and unfortunately I have not gone to Haiti, which I would love to go to, um, because I feel like I'm very in tune with my Greek side and not so much with my Haitian side. Um, and so I definitely want to like dive that. into that. Yeah. Cause yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's me. So I need to, I feel like I need to know all about it. Yeah. So we have a little less than 10 minutes left of the show. No. Sorry to break your heart. <laughs> oh, by too fast. Yeah. It does. <laughs> um, but I did want to ask you, have you both finally made, well, not to say that you finally made peace, right? But have you, do you feel more sure about your both of these sides of yourself and um less of that gray middle ground area that we've been talking about and um if you do or if you don't like why is that yeah oh okay teacher um 
I think we should go to Alex. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to say that it's a work in progress, um, depending on what it is that's going on. I'm very um, in tune with who I am, and I'm super proud of being Greek and Haitian or of mixed race, so to speak. Um, and I think as time goes on, like with anything in life, certain things happen and you have to like reevaluate a situation again because who knows what tomorrow brings. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to say that there will always be that gray area. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, how we choose to perceive it or deal with it. Yeah. Mm. Can I say that for me, um, I also had a gray area. You had said earlier, like, where do brown people fall or where do Latinos fall? Right. Um, I didn't want to speak too much of that because I definitely do want to put the focus on both of your stories. But um, when I did have that gray area, it was through a friend that um, I started really questioning what I was. Um, shout out to Satin because she really, she's one of those black women that are very educated in who they are, their ancestry. She's gone, she does the whole research, has gone to museums. Um, and it was through her that I really got curious about myself. And so I did a 23andMe hey. because, yeah, because nice. I was like, well, I have no idea what I really am, you know? And um, turns out I'm. Ha be there's a lot of percentages but the overall percentage was um, half Native American like India Wow. Um, and then the other half was Spaniard go figure you know <laughs> so uh, um, when well, I and they missed me, so. yeah <laughs> and when I found out about that I was like wait a minute what I'm mm. Native American because so many people would always say like um, maybe I was Arabic or maybe I was whatever I don't know I thought I was black <laughs> for a little while you know I had all these questions I mean there is some black in there because the percentages tell you but I was never really sure mm. and um, so that I had to do some of that investigation for myself you know yeah. yeah, just to kind of understand and I've gone back to Colombia and I've came, I came out to my family in Colombia um, I took my wife you know I did Beautiful. those things yeah and I really had to explore that about myself yeah. you know and mm -hmm. that's how I found out yeah, I, so thank you for holding space for me. I had to think about it for a little bit, mm -hmm. only because y'all are born and raised here in Miami, but mm -hmm. I'm obviously, like I said, not from here. I've only lived here for about two years, and I've had to understand race and ethnicity a lot differently here than I've ever had to before. Okay. Um, even when I would go visit my family in, in New York or in Panama, I felt like I was more sure than when I moved here. Okay. And I'll say that only because there's very strong injustices that have happened between um, in Cuba, um, in Haiti, you know, the wet foot, dry foot, something that I knew about growing up, but it didn't affect me because I lived here. in Texas, I yeah. wasn't here. And so now I see, right, <laughs> like actually how that played out. And I'm like, oh shit, this is like, a lot different than I've ever had to You're really navigate. To the communities and yeah, and, and, and so you know, I haven't really gotten to know the Latin community here. Um, you know, I've I've lived downtown, I've lived in Little Haiti, and now I'm in Liberty City. Most of the spaces that I that I'm in here in Miami are predominantly black, um, and I'm trying to figure out what that means for me because usually it's it's everything and everybody and it's just all you know una mezcla of people mm -hmm. but here i feel like there has to be you know even though san antonio had the like neighborhood boundaries people still interacted with each other um but i feel like here it's it's a lot different it's very yeah it's super clickish in more ways than one um but yeah i so you're like navigating. Through. I'm navigating through that and what that looks like in Miami because I don't want to erase the 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 Latin within. Right. But I also like. How I've, do you find that that space? Yeah. Here and where you actually navigate. Yeah. And you want to know something? Um, I was born and raised here mm -hmm. in Haiti, and uh, um, I my wife is from up north, from New Jersey, and then lived in New York, and she always told me, baby, here in Miami people are very clicky you know black people with black people latinos with latinos it's very and i'm like no like what do you mean like right. I, I i didn't notice that and then we started traveling more and i was traveling more and 
we were exploring these things and she would point out to me wait till we get to new york wait till we get to new jersey we've been to texas and then i that started making sense to me and i was like okay like i noticed that now here in miami mm-hmm. and now i can say yeah we're very cliquish here and you know and people stay within their their own communities a lot granted there's other people you know like ourselves that we right we travel throughout and mm-hmm. we have all types of friends right but it can be difficult here and i definitely hear where you're coming from and so with that being said um i mean i know this is a very broad question but i'd like to hear from both of you before we end the show ultimately how do you see your future um being biracial and how would you like to be represented more in our country how would you like our people to to understand that idea and to represent it mm. huh is it oh, okay um i would say something that's very close and dear to my heart um is education and literacy i was telling all a little bit before we started that i was i was a teacher um i see a future where people are able to tell their own stories. I see a future where white women are not making stories for black children, but black women, black men are making stories for black children and that there's more of that. Um, I was talking to an an author today that made a book about an Afro-Latinx boy that likes to be a mermaid. It's called Julian is a Mermaid. It's a beautiful book mm-hmm. if y'all haven't seen it. Um, but the woman is white. She's not Afro-Latinx. And so but I, she's speaking about the But experience. she's speaking about the experience. And so mm-hmm. I, I Facebooked her. I was like, hey, you know, your success is awesome. Like, I'm celebrating you as a woman. Um, but it's frustrating because here I am, an Afro-Latinx author trying to get published. And now you just wrote a story about this Afro-Latinx kid this is kind of strange Mm. and so in my future my immediate future I see more people being able to tell their stories Mm -hmm. I see uh, newscasters on Univision that have natural hair Mm -hmm. or locks let's talk about we can't even address locks yet but (laughs) they have you know the features they have African features and you know they're from Colón you know they're from Loisa they're from um, you know just different barrios that are predominantly African. Um, I see it in the future more synergy amongst each other. Um, I'll second that. Yeah, with the islands, with 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 you know the lower um, Latin America, with us and Estados Unidos, like all of us really coming together. First Nations included. First Nations included. We need to include the First Nations. <laughs> in the struggle, because their struggle is primary in this country, I see them telling their stories and telling them marvelously and beautifully. Um, so for hmm, our future, I think it'll be bright. Um, like she had mentioned, I see more synergy. Um, I'm hoping that maybe one day our children will not have to maybe deal with these um, I don't want to say uncertainties, but like trying to figure out who they are and what they are and like why does that even matter maybe? Like we're people. I mean, love is love and we should all love <laughs> each other and you know, I think we need to come to a point as just a society and realize that we are all different and unique, but that's what makes us beautiful and we should love and accept that for what it is. Like we don't need to constantly, you know, label people or put people in these boxes when you know we all live in this box it's called earth and you know we need to you know love each other and again just really accept and embrace our differences for what they are that was awesome thank you so much both of you for being here we reached the end um i quickly wanted to ask how can people stay in touch with you um with your projects i know yahida you have events coming up um, you're also a writer, and you have so many amazing projects for our community. Um, can you give out your handles and how maybe your email or whatever way you feel comfortable with people who are listening to be in touch with you? Sure. Um, my handles, 
is my first name, Yahida, and then rights, like Rome Free Rights. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be completely honest, I don't do a lot on there. Mm -hmm. And I would say the best way is to find me in real life. <laughs> um, because I dislike social media a That's lot. That's perfectly okay. Either way, I have you linked on Rome Free Rights. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, you can find me on yes. Christian's website. So if you come for me, they'll, you'll, they'll find you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to second her her absence on uh, social media because I am not a poster. Which I love. That's so I'll refreshing. post some music for y'all, some good tunes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's Alex, A-L-E-X, Tertullian, my last name. And uh, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate both of Thank these you stories. For having We're us. definitely going to have a part two to unpack more of this. Um, to all the listeners out there, thank you so much for listening to Meet That Mondays on Jolt Radio. Uh, tune back in June 25th at 7 p.m. for a new episode. You can listen to all past episodes of Meet Them Mondays on RomeFreeRights.com. And you can find me on all social channels at Rome Free Rights. I'm your host, Cristian Portillo. I'm signing off. Thank you. Thank you, girl. Thank you. That was very short. That was super short. It goes by so fast. I know. It really does. It's Thank you everyone who tuned in on the Facebook um, live. This is Yahaira. This is Ali. Hey, hey, hey. You already know how you can reach them. I tag them there. We also have a post on roamfreerights.com. And yeah, yeah. And Yahaira's up to some really cool things. So you definitely want to stay in touch Check with her. her out. Yes. Thank you all for listening. And we will see you June 25th. John, thank you.